everyone take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 1. Lloyd just sang about God being his father. And uh, that's a good question to ask yourself. Is God my father? Is God your father? I think we'd all like to just automatically conclude that to be the case. But to have God as your father, you have to be born of God. Which means you have to be born again which means you have to consider yourself a born-again Christian, which if you say you're a born-again Christian, then there needs to be a time and place in your life where you became a Christian. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't take place by your first birth. It's something that takes place by a, a second birth, a spiritual birth. And that is what Jesus referred to in John chapter 3 when he said, except ye be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of of God. So if you don't know if God is your father this morning, well, that's the decision you need to be evaluating. Uh, is God my father? And if not, then how do I make him my father? And how do I go about that? Because you want to make sure God is your father. The only people he welcomes into heaven are his family members. Because it's his... Remember what Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples and he said, um, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, I go and prepare a place for you, and if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. In other words, if you want to get into heaven in the Father's house, you've got to be a part of the family of God. So you need to be born into that. That's a decision you make. It doesn't matter what your parents did to you as a child. No water can make you a child of God. It doesn't matter what you do on a weekly basis when it comes to going to church or giving money to a church or participating in some noble deed. That doesn't make you a child of God either. You say, well, what makes me a child of God? Glad you asked. John chapter 1, verse number 12. But as many as received Jesus to those people, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The path to becoming a citizen of heaven, the path to citizenship, the path to become a child of God is to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Why do I have to do that? Because you and I are sinners. And nothing can take away our sin except the blood of Christ. And so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ came to die for our sins, to take them away, to give us forgiveness of God. And so when we receive Christ, we're receiving his, his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. We're receiving his sacrifice to replace our condemnation, to replace our punishment. And when, when Jesus takes that for us, we no longer bear any sin in God's eyes. We are forgiven of the Lord. And we can have eternal salvation and become the children of God. So not everybody's a child of God. In fact, if you, if you, if you want to be a, a child of any family in this world, you have to be born into that family. The same is true spiritually. So I urge you this morning to evaluate your spiritual uh, condition. That's all free. You're in Mark chapter 1. Back in 1989, a youth leader in Michigan read a book written by Charles Sheldon, which was written nearly a hundred years earlier. And the book was entitled, In His Steps. And it had a subtitle below that title that read, What Would Jesus Do? The youth leader's name was Janie Tinklenberg, and she was really impressed by this book. She took it to heart, and she thought the message of what would Jesus do would really resonate with the youth that she was ministering to, and she said, I've got to get this uh, and really in, impregnated into their minds. I want to get this theme in their lives on a daily basis, not just in Sunday school or in youth class. And so she decided to take this phrase, what would Jesus do, and put it on a bracelet. The time friendship bracelets were very popular. And rather than try to write what would Jesus do along the outside of this bracelet, she decided to make an acronym and thus was birthed the movement WWJD. What would Jesus do? Perhaps you remember this, but millions and millions of products since then have been sold, and it became a very well-known acronym that many people ran to. And I bring that up because we're essentially going through a sermon series that, that is intended to answer that question. The idea of that movement was whatever you're going through in life, quick look at your bracelet or look at your shirt or whatever and ask yourself, before I make a decision, what would Jesus do? 
which is a great question to ask and a really good thought to have. And we're doing that by going through the life of Christ. We're talking about growing into Christ. And we're essentially asking ourselves, what would Jesus do if he were walking in my shoes? Growing into Christ requires growing into the knowledge of Christ. We cannot choose to do what Jesus did unless we know what Jesus did, which requires knowledge. I mean, you could ask that question all day long. You can go out into the world and, and at the workplace. All right, what would Jesus do right now? But if you have no knowledge of what he actually did, it's useless. If you don't know what he did in Matthew, in the book of Mark, in the book of Luke, in the book of John... That question is just a spiritual catchphrase. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Oh, I don't know. I've never read those Gospels, or I don't remember those Gospel accounts, or I have no idea what he would have done. I think today the knowledge of Christianity is overall waning, and a lot of people think they know Jesus. They'll actually tell it to you. Oh, I don't think Jesus would have done that. Well, how do you know? I I want to make sure we have some substance to our argument. We should know what Jesus did. Then we can answer what Jesus would do. Amen? Amen. Which is why knowledge of Christ is so important. And remember, this series is based on the fact, the biblical fact, that every Christian, every child of God has two natures. He or she has an earthly nature and a heavenly nature, a sinful nature and a divine nature, a nature that takes after Adam and a nature that takes after Christ. An old one and a new one. Every Christian has two natures inside of him. And he or she has to make a decision, which nature am I going to follow? If someone is born again, then they have another life. They have another nature. They have another identity. And that is what Christians have, two identities. When we become born again by faith in Jesus Christ, we receive a second nature, and unfortunately, we do not lose our first nature. The new nature doesn't replace the old one. They have to cohabitat, they cohabitate inside our soul, and there's friction. Uh, selfishness abounds in the old nature. Humility abounds in the new nature, and there's this battle as to what am I going to do today? Am I going to be selfish, or am I going to be humble? Am I going to take... Or am I going to give? And that's why we're saying we want to grow into Christ. We want to feed the new nature, become the new nature, so that the old nature doesn't have any impact in our lives. If we choose the old nature, we will have problems. If we choose the new nature, we will find ourselves liberated from many of our problems. If we choose Adam's nature, then we will be frustrated, aggravated, and irritated. If we choose Christ's nature, then we will be liberated, motivated, and elated. The abundant life Jesus came to give us, it's within our reach because it's within us. The abundant life that Jesus told us he gave us in John 10.10, 10, we have it. We just have to choose it. We have to live it. We have to do what Jesus did by knowing what he did and by following his leadership. So the question, what would Jesus do, may be better asked by saying, what nature should I choose? What nature should I choose? We should choose the nature of Christ. Today we're going to move on to influencing people. When it comes to meeting new people, when it comes to interacting with new people, or old people for that, matter, for that matter, when it comes to influencing people of all ages, of all sizes, of all backgrounds, what would Jesus do? We can answer that question by asking, what did Jesus do? That's why you're in Mark chapter 1. I think I said Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus just got baptized. John the Baptist is the one who baptized him. And then Jesus, after his baptism, was driven into the wilderness where he would be tempted of Satan after 40 days of fasting without food or water. And we read in verse 14 that Jesus began his ministry after John was in prison. So it says in verse 14, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee. Remember that fact, please, before we... Before we go too much further, because it's going to come into play in, in short time. So now after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee, 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway, or immediately, they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship, mending or repairing their nets. And straightway, immediately, he called them. And they, too, left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after Jesus. I have always found this passage fascinating. I've always found it fascinating that these two guys, in fact, these four guys, all of whom would appear to be lifelong fishermen, anglers of the sea, uh, working their occupation, probably relatively strong guys, very knowledgeable of the sea, blue-collar dudes, up comes this stranger and says, Hey, guys, follow me. And they look at him and say, Great idea. Drop their nets, leave their career behind, leave their occupation behind, and just follow Jesus. How many have wondered this? Like, we know Jesus is the Son of God, but what did he do? Hypnotize them? Did he just look into their eyes and they believed in him? How could he influence these men to leave everything they knew? I, I, I have found that men don't like to leave work for any good reason. I have found that marriages today suffer because their beautiful brides at home and their wonderful kids at home want them to come and leave work for a little bit, and they don't do that. And yet these guys, just a stranger walks up, hey, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Boop, and they follow him. See you, Dad. Family business. See you later. I'm going to follow this stranger named Jesus. Listen, we're going to find that there's more to this story, but can we all agree that Jesus Christ, while he was on this earth, earth was incredibly influential? He got guys to follow him and give up everything for him without doing too much, truthfully. This was a moment of time, a spontaneous moment of time. These four fishermen took their lifelong occupation and family business, cast it aside, followed a stranger. They didn't consult with their wives. They didn't consult with their present employers. They didn't talk to their accountant. They didn't talk to their friends. They didn't talk to their counselors. They didn't pray about it. They didn't ask about benefits, insurance, retirement, office location, the commute to work. They didn't talk about the risks to their job. They just said, sure, we'll follow you. We'll give up everything. Jesus Christ had a profound people a profound impact on people. You say, well, that's, that's Jesus, Pastor. Don't think I'm going to ever get anybody to follow me like that. Don't expect me to ever be that influential on people. I'm just the son of Joe. I'm the son of Peter. I'm the son of Jeff. He was the son of God. Well, I'll give you that. Your first nature, your physical nature, your earthly identity, you and I are not going to be that influential. There are certainly people who are more influential on others than other people will be, but we're not going to do what Jesus did here with our old nature. But remember, we just talked about becoming children of God. If you are a son of God, if you are a daughter of God, you have the nature of Christ, which means you have Jesus Christ's nature, meaning you too can have a profound impact on people. You too can be influential in the lives of people if you choose the nature of Christ. Jesus was influential for a reason. We're going to go over to John chapter 1. Let's go to John chapter 1. This will shed more light on Mark chapter 1. Because Mark and his gospel gave us a synopsis. He gave us a summary of what happened there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. John's going to go into some greater detail about the Messiah's relationship with at least... Simon and Andrew. So we're going to read verse 35, but understand the beginning portion of the chapter talks about John the Baptist introducing Jesus to the community as the Lamb of God, as the Messiah. And so chronologically, John 1 takes place before Mark chapter 1. In verse 35, 
it says this, Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, how do I know this takes place before Mark chapter 1? Remember that detail about John being in prison? John's not in prison in John chapter 1, which means this is before Mark chapter 1, okay? It's an important detail, and it will make sense of the rest of Mark. Verse number 37, And the two disciples, those are John's disciples, not Jesus' disciples, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw, um, saw them following, and saith unto them, What you want, boys? What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say master. It's an interpreted term, master. Master, where dwellest thou? Where do you live? Let me just stop right there. If two guys followed you down an alley and asked where you lived, <laughs> what's your initial thought process, right? Master, where do you live? <laughs> you never met these guys. You don't know who they are. But they're just, all, you know, Jesus kind of, he hears them walking What's up, boys? And they said, where do you live? That's the situation here, okay? Just understand that. Uh, he says, verse 39, come and see. Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two, referring to one of the two disciples of John, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said, saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. You say, why was Christ so influential? Well, I can say with confidence, number one, that Jesus Christ was influential in the lives of people because it was in his nature to be inviting. Jesus Christ, by divine nature, born of God, son of God, child of God, it was in his nature to be inviting to people. Two strangers, they ask him where he lives. His response was not one of fear. It was not of paranoia. It was not, he would not do well in today's security, uh, protect ourselves from the big bad world mentality that we have. He'd say, hey, come and see. You guys want to see where I live? Come and see. Come have some tea with me. Have some coffee with me. Come see where I live. We can hang out in the porch or in the living room and we can talk. Mark chapter 1 was not Andrew and Simon's first encounter with Jesus Christ. Okay? So this idea that they're, they're mending their nets and they're, they're fishing and some stranger walks up and says, Hey guys, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And they say, Sounds good to us. And, and they just follow him. They were not looking into the eyes of a stranger. They were not listening to a stranger. They had already met Jesus once. Andrew, who was a disciple of John, met Jesus Christ. And when he met Jesus, he ran and got Simon Peter's brother and introduced Peter to Jesus. And Jesus' first response to Peter was fantastic. He says, he looks at him and says, You're Simon, the son of Jonah. I shall call you Cephas, which means stone. So now let's put this in modern day language. Jesus meets him and says, hey, you're Peter, the son of Jonah. I'm going to give you a nickname, The Rock. Your new name is The Rock. So from now on, what's up, Rock? If you're Peter, how do you feel after meeting this man for the first time? Have your defenses come down a little bit? Yes, you're skeptical. Yes, you're watching him carefully. Yes, you're not sure what he's all about. But hey, he called me by my name. He knows who my father is and cares about that. And he gave me a nickname, called me Cephas, called me Stone, called me the Rock. Jesus was hospitable. Jesus was welcoming. Jesus was inviting. 
And, and I know some of you might be thinking, well, those first two guys that Jesus said, come and see, they were disciples of John. They were religious guys. They were not threatening guys. They were, they were guys that he would easily welcome into his presence. Well, how about Peter? I don't think Peter was a religious man. Based on what I know about Peter, Peter was a blue-collar, non-religious guy. When he gets to the, the, uh, the eve before the crucifixion, he cursed with ease, which means he probably had a sailor's mouth. After all, he was an angler. He was a fisherman. And when Jesus shows up and a few uh, encounters later, J Peter says, depart from me, Jesus, for I am a wicked man. I don't think Peter was a religious guy in any way. He was a blue-collar, rough and tough guy down at the docks. And Jesus welcomed him, took notice of him, acknowledged him, and gave him a nickname. Can we talk about nicknames for a second? If you know me, those of you who have known me for a long time, I give nicknames out liberally. But I get in trouble with people. I'll meet somebody for the first time here even, and I'll give them a nickname and never see them again. Because I think it scares them. I think they think I've already got their bank account information, I know where they live, and I've, I've dug into their life and they never come back. I give out nicknames. Why do I do that? Because that's my twisted way of telling you, hey, I care about you. I never call my wife Tara. I'll call her all kinds of names, but not Tara. Why? Because you call her Tara. Anybody can call her Tara. I got special names for her. You say, what are they? Eh, they range, depending on my mood. <laughs> my kids. I never call my kids by their names, except for maybe when they're in trouble, but they have all unique names that no one else calls them. In fact, my youngest her nickname is Bubsba. Does anybody call her that? No, they never will. That's my special name for her. So she, even if she doesn't like it, she knows it's special. Uh, my, my co-worker, do you know I never call him Phil? He's Dr. Phil. He's Philopotamus. He's Phil Maestro. He's, he's everything but Phil. Why? Because you guys can call him Phil. I got special names for him. And so I call people by their different names. Rayman, TC. Uh, we've got Fozzie the Bear and uh, Honest Abe and Uncle Abe and Maya. And, and I call people by nicknames. Why? I'm trying to let you know, hey, I care about you. You're special to me. I'm trying to invite you into my life. I'm trying to be a, a, of some value to you. That's what Jesus did here. Out of nowhere, he says, you will be Cephas. That was a nickname. That was, hey, Peter. You're going to be the rock from now on. It's a special thing. People ask me, why do you ask so many questions, PK? There's this growing reputation now that I have that if I take you out for lunch or invite you to my house or spend time with you, that I will look into your eyes and I will capture your thoughts and your emotions and I will pull all the deep, dark secrets out of your life. And there's a growing movement now. It's like hashtag don't talk to PK. It's this... <laughs> It's, you know, they cover their mouths and I won't do it, PK. I won't tell you anything. I ask questions not because I want to meddle, but because I want to show you I care about you. I want to know about your father. I want to know about your background. Jesus was doing that. He said, you're Simon, the son of, the son of Jonah. I know your background. I've talked to your brother. I know who you are. I'm going to give you a nickname. He was trying to invite him in. Remember, Simon Peter would become the leader of the early church. He was influencing him. I have learned in life that people are desperate to feel wanted. People are desperate to feel wanted. I don't know why Luke just looked at me and walked away when I said that. But. I mean, he did. He looked right at me and said, I don't feel very wanted, PK. I'm out of here. <laughs> what a good sport. Look at that. He just walked right out. Had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but it's true. If you're, in a, if you're in a strained marriage right now, guarantee it, 100%, your spouse doesn't feel wanted. You don't feel wanted. If your child and you are on different pages and there's some strain there, no matter the age, one or both of you don't feel wanted by the other person. Everyone yearns to be wanted. And that's not a bad feeling, by the way. We're social creatures. We all want to be of some value to somebody. We all want to be special to someone. And when we start to feel like we're not special, we start to feel unwanted, 
we draw back and we feel bad about that. That's humanity. You can say that's petty, but you're denying the fact that you have that same feeling. People who would say, no, 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 not me. I don't need to be wanted. You're probably the guy or the gal that has all these people around you anyways that love you. But if they all betrayed you today and you were left alone in the corner with your thumb to suck on, you would say, I don't feel very wanted because it's humanity. Why? Listen, in schools, kids go off and pout. Kids go off and do terrible things to themselves and other people because they don't feel wanted. You know what Jesus had a really good uh, gift of doing? Making you feel wanted. After all, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you ever feel unwanted, I want you to turn to the heavens and look up at the sky. I want you to think of God, and then I want you to go to the cross. And I want you to see on that cross is a symbol. It's an emblem. It's a manifestation of God wanting you, of God wanting me. Now, can I confess my faults one to another? I, I am prone at times to feeling bad for myself. I, uh, as a pastor, you're not typically wanted because you're the guy that's going to say, you should do this or you shouldn't do that. Or I don't want to go to the pastor because he might. Well, then you become an unwanted figure in many ways. People see you coming and, you know, they find some, Luke. I mean, the guy walked right. He was in the front row and he walked right out. As a father, guess what it's easy to become? Unwanted, because you're the guy that says, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And it's easy to feel like maybe I'm just a burden to everybody. And there wasn't some, some time ago, there wasn't too long in my prayer with God that God just said, hey, pal, even if you're never wanted by any person in the whole wide world, I want you. And it was brief, and it was, it was just for a few moments, and, and I, my humanity at the best of me, but God just wrapped his arms around my soul, and like Uncle Sam, he said, I want you. And I said, count me in. Let's get back to work, God. People want to feel wanted. Guys, if you want to fix your marriage, it really is no more complicated than making your wife feel wanted. I saw a sign, my wife and I were souvenir shopping recently and we saw a great sign it said i love you like i love football <laughs> how romantic is that <laughs> guys your ladies want to feel more wanted than football than work whatever it may be that's how they want to feel you say ladies uh we don't have that problem with our husbands either do we oh yes you do Guys won't communicate it. Guys won't show it. But men want to feel wanted by their wives. You say, well, I, she, he knows I want him because I'm constantly telling him he needs to be home. <laughs> yeah, but listen to yourself. I'm constantly telling him, ah, you mean you're constantly telling him he's not doing a good enough job? He may not feel so wanted then. He may feel more mothered than wanted. Your children. You want your children to perform for you, to succeed for you, to build a relationship with you? Make them feel wanted. Not just robotic servants of your will and way. Let them know how desperate you are to have a serious, intimate, lifelong relationship with you. See, most kids feel like they have to be perfect to be accepted by you. And because they're not perfect, and because they're afraid you'll find out they're not perfect, they go away. It really does boil down so simply to just wanting to feel wanted. Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 made Peter and Andrew feel wanted. Come, come and see. You're Simon, the son of Jonah. I'm going to call you stone. I'm going to call you rock. Turn over very, very quickly to, Mark, or to Luke chapter 5. We are not going to go through all the points this morning, so I'll just give you the first two, and it will be enough, I hope, to help you where you may be of some influential value to another person, a stranger even, but it may be the person you're sitting next to this morning or the person you work next to tomorrow or the, the person you uh, laid next to tonight or the child you sit with uh, on the couch, but 
you and I can be influential if we let Jesus' nature come forward through us. Luke chapter 5, this is more of the details of Mark chapter 1. Verse number 1, Luke chapter 5, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, that is uh, the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. If you've ever read this encounter and said to yourself, man, Jesus was really bold. He went down to the docks, jumped in a fisherman's boat, told the fisherman, hey, push me out a little bit so I can use your boat to teach the people religious teachings. If you've, if you've never stopped and think about that, try that today. Okay, go down to Lake Erie, find somebody who's going to go out on a fishing expedition, just jump in their boat and say, hey, pal, can you just push me out a little bit so I can read my Bible for three hours? He's going to say, get out of that boat or I'm going to beat the snot out of you right now. This is Simon Peter, and Jesus says, hey, Simon, I'm going to use your boat. I know you needed to make a living. I'm going to use your boat. Why don't you push me out a little bit so no one else can get on here, and I'll teach the people. You know why Simon let him do that? Because he already met him. And so Jesus says, hey, rock. You and me were tight, remember? We're BFFs, we met. Can I use your boat? Simon says, sure, sure. That's why John chapter 1 is so important. Luke chapter 5, verse number 4, And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, ooh, that's an interesting word for a stranger. Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. This is the point in Mark's gospel where Jesus says, Come ye after me. It's the, it's the point in Matthew 4 where Jesus says, Follow me. And in verse 11, When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Jesus was so influential in the lives of these four men, in the lives of these two men, in the lives of many people, men and women alike. He was able to influence them for a lifetime. Why, number one, because he was inviting. He was welcoming. He was hospitable. He broke down those barriers. He showed you that he cared. He invited you into his life. He, he dug into your life to make you feel wanted and special. And then, with that platform he built, that platform called hospitality, he stood on top of it and gave people truth. And it inspired them. He understood the seas. He understood where the schools of fish were. And he told Peter, he told Andrew, who would then tell uh, James and John, listen, throw your nets over there. You'll get plenty of fish. All right. So many fish that they were astonished. You say, I can't inspire anybody. My, both mics on. You guys are trying to figure it out. Which one should I use? Use the pulpit. I can't move. To inspire someone means to breathe new life into them, to infuse their mind with new ideas, to captivate them. Jesus did that. Not just with this principle of throw your nets over there and you'll get a lot of fish, but he said, hey, hey, follow me, guys. I'll make you fishers of men. So these guys who spent a, a lifetime kept capturing fish that they could eat thought about, wow, we could, we could catch people? We could... We could impact people. We could influence people. We could have a, a place in this world that would do more than just fill the bellies of people. We could, we could do something special in this world. It's something special in life. Yeah. 
Count me in. If you know where the fish are in the sea, you must know how to get the people in this world and attract their souls and, and do something fantastic. Count us in. And they left everything. They left their ships. They left their nets. They left their fathers. They left their servants. And they said, we're going to follow you. And they would follow Jesus till his death and beyond his death. And they would be used to begin the church. They would be the pillars of the church. You're, you're probably sitting there and saying, uh, Pastor, I don't know where the fish are in the sea like Jesus did. I mean, that sounds great and all, but I, I couldn't go on a boat that I've never been on before. I couldn't go on a sea I've never been on before and tell the guys where all the fish are without using some type of mechanical equipment that they already have. So I can't really help inspire anybody. Well, I'm going to boil it down to a more simplified opportunity for you. Jesus was telling the men something they didn't know that was true. The fish were in the sea. Jesus knew where they were. The men didn't know, but it was true. Cast your nets on that side, you'll get fish. You and I may not be able to tell somebody something that miraculous, but what we can tell them is something they don't already know, something that is true that they don't already know. You say, like what? You ready? The word of God. Is this true? Oh, yeah, yeah. And someone who doesn't know it's truth will be astonished when they learn about it. You say, where, how? All right, all right. Read your Bible, get to know it well, and then talk to your friend or talk to a stranger that you've met and have become friends with them. Talk to them about how the Bible gives them the, gives them the answers to their marital problems. You begin to give someone scripture that will help them in their marriage and they put it to practice and see that it works you know what they do their eyes get bigger new ideas true ideas things that work things that help now they're beginning to get inspired moved you are influencing a life for a lifetime but you've got to be hospitable so that they'll listen to the word of god You've got to be inviting so that they care about what you have to say. That's why holding a sign on the corner of the road that condemns and that tells somebody how bad they are, that's not going to get them to listen to you. You have to get them to feel wanted. You know, sometimes when you hold up a sign that says, turn or burn, doesn't make them feel very wanted. You want to turn, you don't want to burn, but you want to turn from them. We're doing things for the church that we need to be doing as individuals now that are intended to make our community feel wanted. We care about you. Amen. God loves you, which means we love you. He sent his son to show you that. We've got to do some other things to show you that so we can give you truth. And when you learn truth, it may just astonish you. And it may just inspire you. I never saw that before exactly. It's not anything in me. It's not anything in you. It's the word of God working through us. The nature of Christ. You say, I, it's not my personality, PK, to be very friendly. I'm going to be frank. I'm just going to be, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm just not a very nice person. I just saw some people say amen to that. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You may be totally correct. But that's your DNA. That's your first birth. That's your Adamic nature. That's your old nature. If you're a believer, within you is the nature of Christ. And he is inviting. He is hospitable. Which means you have to choose his nature. It's just not in me. Oh, that's the problem. You're trying to do it. You're trying to do something you're not good at doing. Stop trying to do what you can't do. Let Christ do in you what he can do. How do I do that? It's so hard. You've got to forget your old nature. Lose your old nature. Lose your life to find his. Die to the flesh to get the new life that Christ offers you. You'll be shocked. If you give up on you to give Christ an opportunity to work through you, you'll be inviting. You'll be hospitable. You'll be welcoming. And then... Don't give up 
on Christ, let him do the inspiring by letting him speak of the word of God. You know what we do when we are acting like we and us and me and I, we speak about me, myself, and I. That's what we do. When we let the nature of Christ take over, he speaks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Depends what nature you want to choose. Choose the old nature, you won't be hospitable, and you won't be very inspiring. Choose the new nature. You'll be hospitable, you'll be inspiring, because you'll talk about truth, you'll talk about things that will really move people. So what would Jesus do? Well, look in the Gospels to see what he did do. Now you have a choice. To choose your nature, his nature. The not-so-abundant life, or the abundant life. The not-so-influential life or the very influential life. We'll skip the third point. It's time for spaghetti. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.